Hello, hello. Uh, hey, Mick, can you hear me? Yes, I hear you now. Excellent. Yep, yep. I can hear you. Yep. Good stuff. All right, all right, all right. Let's give it one more minute and let's uh, let's get into this. Did everybody else get some uh, get some pizza? We seriously have pizza downstairs, and. Uh, just had a slice. I'll be posting a picture um, on the uh, on the meetup just to prove it. So can't get, can't have uh, can't have a big day to meet up without pizza. <laughs> Although I'm, I'm sorry, we could not provide pizza for the rest of you only in digital form. Cool, I see people rolling in. <clears throat> Doug, Doug, I was on an Elastic conference call last week and uh, they delivered pizza, Domino's, <laughs> to people's houses. It was pretty awesome. Get out of town, really? Yeah. That is awesome. <laughs> but I don't know about the Domino's part, but the pizza was good. <laughs> <laughs> That's really cool. That's so cool. Yeah, we got, I think we've got uh, critical, critical mass here. Um, so uh, hopefully everybody can see the, um, see the, uh, the sign here, the uh, Cleveland Big Data Meetups. Thank you so much for keeping the tradition alive. I look forward to the day when we can all do this in person, but for right now, we obviously have to be safe and, um, and uh, you know, and, and do this virtually. Um, so keeping with the tradition, I'd like to, um, let's, you know, if we've got any recruiting shout outs, um, probably maybe, why don't you make it, uh, just type them in the chat. I think that might be probably be easier that way. Uh, we're not all talking over each other. Um, so let's take maybe two minutes. If, if anyone's hiring or anyone's interested in looking, um, for, uh, for anything, uh, please type it into the chat now. Um, let's see, I don't see anything. Give it a, uh, give it a minute or two. Um, so, uh, in all likelihood, um, July is going to be, I actually had a speaker lined up for July, um, and the July one almost certainly is going to be, um, is going to be a virtual. Um, I think the, uh, I think the, uh, it's a, it's low probability of the mega meetup on for happening this year, unfortunately. Um, I would, I'd love to have it happen, but I, I, I think it's a pretty low uh, probability of, of having a multi-hundred person event in uh, September. So um, who knows, may, things may change, but it looks like we're gonna be virtual here for, um, for a few more meetups. Um, everybody see the news about O'Reilly Media? I mean, just uh, killing a little bit of time here. Um, that's pretty crazy. They uh, shut down their live, um, their live uh, conference business. So they didn't just cancel the, um, they didn't just cancel like uh, Strata Data, for example, in the fall, they actually shut down the live conference business. Um, it's crazy times and it's really sad. So I, I hope at some point in the future that they can reboot that, uh, that business because it's a, it was a tremendous, they did a, they did a fantastic job at it. Um, so let's uh, let's get started with our uh, our first speaker on the docket is uh, Doug uh, Doug Huber um, from uh, Lorraine uh, Community College and he's going to do a talk on big data ethics. So again, um, same rules apply. I'm going to do the uh, the timer here uh, for 20 minutes. Um, so Doug, if you could, I'm going to stop sharing now. Um, Doug, if you can uh, uh, get set up. Um, and uh, take it when, whenever you're ready, take it away. Okay, can you see my slide there? Yes, we can. Okay, great. Um, I'm just gonna try to leave you folks some thoughts on some issues 
that came out of um, a number of student papers. Uh, I had the opportunity to uh, oversee a class on legal framework of data analytics, and then there was a, a senior projects class over in the University of Akron side and computer information sciences. And a lot of them cover data analytics type topics and, and technology in general. And of course, the, the COVID-19 pandemic is always on top of mind as a thread through probably almost all of them. Um, but something that came to my mind in, in kind of reading these and listening to their presentations was that, you know, a lot of our privacy that we come to expect uh, over the years is in place because the technology provided it. There were actually barriers there. And um, as those barriers get eroded, you know, those privacy opportunities go away. And uh, we may not actually kind of be aware of it. So I, I kind of distilled up four, four points I kind of wanted to expand upon. Uh, one is the uh, sort of the, the, you know, the prominence of computer output. Uh, this has been around since the beginning of computers, but you know, data that comes out of computers is always right because it came out of a computer. Um, and then the nature of public data has been changing quite a bit. Uh, and it's been a topic in a number of, the, of these kind of classes over the last few years about how public data is becoming even more public. And so we talk a little bit about that. And then one of my favorites, my, my, real, my real career background is in cybersecurity. So um, I've coined this idea of the puzzle effect, uh, the idea of that um, private information is often hidden in public information. And uh, we're not always aware of that either. And then kind of wrap up with talking about some of these barriers and, and how they're getting breached. So computer output, um, the psychology has, has been around for a long time. You know, I, I have a graduate degree in, in economics. Um, and I have an early 1970s kind of data analytics degree in a way. And uh, one of my earliest uh, jobs was uh, working with a financial institution. And uh, my assignment was to update um, a model that would help them do um, foreign currency trading. And, and it was on an old GE time sharing system. So I mean, this is really back ancient times, but it kind of highlights this cache of computer output effect. And so, you know, I, I went about trying to find all the parts and pieces that are all written in basic. And, uh, and I, I came to the conclusion, I found the back end piece, the reporting piece, but I could not find the model. And having just graduated with a degree in, in econometrics, uh, I'm looking for regression uh, equations and whatnot. And so I finally went to my boss, who was a VP at the time. And I said to him, you know, I think I found the reporting piece, but I can't find the actual model. And he had this, got this big smile on his face. He kind of looked out the window, wheeled around in his chair and said, that's right, you just graduated from college, didn't you? <laughs> he says, yeah, we know there's no model. He says, I read the, you know, the international financial news and I call my other colleagues at banks around the world. And uh, I just fill in these tables and then we, you know, format it nicely and, and you know, do some basic arithmetic, summing some things up and doing some calculations and whatnot. Uh, but yeah, that's pretty much it. Um, and so, and his whole excuse was, it looks better coming out of the computer that way. So I think that's with us today. I think we all have this um, kind of psychology that uh, computerized information has some sort of uh, uh, preeminence over, over anything else. Um, and students have this, and this is a topic in academia. Um, there's, a, there's a real problem with students discriminating uh, between everything they find on Google and, and what really is um, scholarly academic uh, research that has some credibility to it, has, been, has had some testing and vetting going on. And um, you know, we have this every year in, in the senior projects class with the research librarians trying to tell them that not everything that pops up in the, in the Google search is something worthy of your research paper. And, uh, and they really have a hard time with it it's because they're just not used to thinking in these kind of terms. And I think we've had this problem in the pandemic, actually. Um, you know, we, we get lots of data on, on uh, number of people being affected, number of people who have died, and those numbers kind of bounce around and there's arguments over what's the real number. And then we find out that maybe not they're counting things the way we think they're counting things. And then we find out that counting these things is actually a much more complex um, job than, than you would think, uh, just you know, armchair quarterback. 
And so um, that wrapped together with the, the models, and there's been a lot of arguments about the models being incorrect and presenting uh, incorrect uh, data and, uh, and whatnot. Um, and it always comes down to, well, what's the model's assumptions? Um, is the data that fed the model really of the quality it needs to be to make a forecast? And um, th this is a problem that I encountered early on in, in the field of, of, of economics. And that's why I got that little quote down there that all models are wrong, but some are useful. You know, the famous George Box uh, came up with that line. And, um, and sometimes I think we, we don't really understand the, some of the purpose of models and how to apply them correctly. And we just go run off and, and, and take their, their predictions. So the key thing for us, I think, in the world of data analytics, big data, is to be aware of all these kind of biases and kind of traps and be aware that the public doesn't have this sort of nuanced thinking. Um, and so you know, one of the things the pandemic has brought out was big data and data analytics has been forefront in this pandemic. You hear about it all the time on the news and in various briefings and whatnot. And, um, and for a lot of people, this is probably the first real awareness of some of, the, of, of some of this stuff coming out of this field. So something to keep in the back of your mind. This is one of my favorite topics, public data becoming more public. You know, two or three decades ago, we, we could all have a meeting like this. And, and uh, I, could, I could tell you actually something kind of a, of a personal nature. And you know, you might tell your spouse, you may tell your some friends at work, but it would pretty much die. You know, the information would kind of attenuate before it got too far. But those days are probably gone. Um, public data is immediately uh, sent around the world. Um, we used to say gossip would spread as fast as wildfire, or it's even better than that now. We call it viral. Information goes viral. Um, so uh, data and private data is getting tougher and tougher to keep. And um, think about early 1800s, you know, and this is back to my idea of the, of, of the privacy barriers were kind of technologically enforced. Um, and we kind of assume that they're still there. But go back to early 1800s, if you were say living in Boston or New York and you uh, uh, maybe have had to follow the law and kind of had a bad reputation and you decided you wanted to turn over a new leaf, well, what would you do? You go west. You go west and start a new life and chances are you know, your past wouldn't follow you. And that's been the subject of many novels of the, you know, the rare case of someone who knew you from before it's kind of stumbles. Uh, and, and a lot of immigrants have that same kind of story. They wanted to kind of leave a past behind and uh, so they immigrate to the U.S. Those days are gone. Um, and those days existed because transportation didn't really, it was so slow, it would take months to go west. Um, information would take weeks in a newspaper to even get anywhere. Uh, information would attenuate very quickly. And so uh, you could have public information that really wouldn't be that damaging. It wouldn't go that far, but those days are gone and we see it all the time you know, in the social media world, you know, somebody says something a little, a little uh, awkward or crazy, or they say something controversial, and, you know, the, the, the Twitter universe lights up, and they're either praised or vilified, you know, instantly. Um, so something else to kind of keep in mind as we work with data, uh, because there's, there's more of a liability with things becoming exposed and getting breached. And I think all of us that are in the data analytics world uh, kind of have a responsibility to kind of be aware of that and do our best. My favorite, my favorite topic, one of my favorite topics is the puzzle effect. And um, this came to mind right after 9-11. Uh, the government was uh, worried after 9-11 that maybe classified information was being divulged on the thousands of websites that exist inside the federal government. And so they had a group of people uh, do a study and they, and they scoured through these websites and the, the result was kind of interesting. The result was we looked at all the websites and no classified information was found in any of, any of them. But if you went across them, you took a, a non-classified fact here and a non-classified fact there, and before you know it, there was classified information being divulged. And, and there's lots of stories like that of companies losing intellectual property, um, by a series of innocuous facts getting out and whatnot. Well, in the world of big data, it's even, it's even more of a problem. Um, and it's a, and if, for those of you folks who work in the, in the healthcare record 
area, you're probably super aware of this, but the idea of re-identification. You know, you can take healthcare records and remove people's names and social security numbers and patient IDs, and you think, well, okay, I've, I've anonymized the data. Uh, but we all know that's not true. Um, there's this re-identification issue where the other innocuous facts like, you know, zip codes and, and other things can easily uh, help you re-identify those people again. And, you know, this is happening, of course, with Google and Facebook and their, and their data collection for marketing efforts and whatnot. You know, the ability to take what doesn't look like um, uh, identifiable data and, and making it identifiable. And so in the world of the COVID-19 pandemic, there's a lot of talk about smartphone apps helping with contact tracing. And of course, we all want to you know, be protected from the virus and, and we all want to you know, help get rid of the virus. So you immediately think, oh yeah, that's a great idea. Let's, let's go to a smartphone app. Uh, well, this, you know, just think about that for a second in terms of where that could lead. You know, the immediate goal of contact tracing might be noble and might, actually may, might be a good thing. But you know, can it be trusted? Can it become abused? Could it be breached or misused? I mean, just think about this. One of the things kind of with the public data idea is that there's a lot of information about all of us that's really pretty public. Um, it's just not that accessible. Um, you know, we'd have to go subscribe to Bin Verify or Spokio and you know, research my neighbor and, and find out that they really have a prison record or something. Um, but if that data became ubiquitously available on a smartphone app, I, I could make that, I could program that app or ask that app to basically discriminate for me. I could say, well, I, I don't want to be around felons. You know, so we could be looking, evaluating people based on religion and education and, and perhaps some kind of wealth index or, or, or that kind of thing, uh, healthcare information, um, and have the phone buzz, you know. So you're standing in line at the grocery store and you and the phone buzzes because the person in front of you, you know, really has a, a record for felony robbery or something. Um, it, these kind of things we have to kind of worry about because, you know, just because it's possible, sometimes maybe it's not the greatest idea. And while, you know, the initial goal of doing contact tracing is, is probably a good one, um, the, how could the abuse happen? And we all know that the abuse is there because, you know, how many how many companies who keep our private information have been breached over the years? The list is too long to even contemplate hardly. Even the federal government can't keep personnel records secured. So with that, um, this whole idea of pre breaching these privacy barriers um, in, in big data, as you folks all know, it's all about maintaining large diverse data sets. And, um, and we're actually getting, I think, into two kinds of data, public and less public. I think private data is getting to be a tough thing to, to uh, actually accomplish. And analysis coupled with these big diverse data sets can actually expose our behaviors. And uh, you know, the famous target marketing case in which the, uh, the father of a young daughter, the daughter was pregnant, he, he didn't know it, uh, but target did by analyzing her shopping behaviors and her preferences, they made, they made the, the, the assumption, the leap, and they were right. Um, and, there, and there's lots of cases like that uh, that are out there where, you know, sometimes um, these apps can know more about us than we know sometimes in terms of uh, our behaviors and our preferences and, and that kind of thing. Couple that with smart devices, you know, Internet of Things, sensors, and whatnot. There's, there's a huge smorgasbord of opportunity um, in, in doing these kind of things for both good and for ill. Back to the technology barrier. We all think we can encrypt our data and keep it private. Now, we all know that even today's technology, you gotta worry about the keys and how the keys are stored in memory and, and can I recover keys out of memory chips after the computer's down? And, and there's, there's a lot of issues, but set those things aside Quantum computing was probably going to breach all this. And uh, while quantum computing is not something that's going to happen next week or even next year, it's, it's on the horizon. And um, I had a student actually write, write an interesting research paper on quantum computing. And one of the sections he had, oddly enough, that stood out in my mind was there's a big privacy issue there because encryption will not be what it is today once quantum computing becomes 
a, you know, a little more available uh, to, to people. So, you know, the question is, are sometimes we are too willing to uh, remove all these barriers, you know, with the smartphone apps or contract, uh, contact tracing and, and, uh, and, and other kind of applications um, for convenience, for expediency, for the, you know, near-term good goal. And then we kind of wish later on that you have, we should have thought that through a little more and, uh, and maybe done something about it. So that leads us to the question of what do we do about it? And I think, now remember what I told you, my actual professional background is cybersecurity. So I'm into frameworks. I'm in big into frameworks. Um, and, uh, and frameworks have been around for actually for a long time. We just haven't maybe called them that uh, you know, for a long time. Technology is going to continue on. We're not going to stop it. You're not going to start to stop the smartphone apps uh, to do in contact tracing. It's, it's probably going to actually kind of happen. The thing is, we need to develop principles. We need to have these frameworks, these principles, but where we actually define for ourselves the barriers. The barriers that used to be there because it just wasn't possible, we need to put them in um, and, and uh, adhere to them and have the discipline to do that. Now, we've, we've got a history of doing this. You know, bioethics has a long history of worrying about these things and trying to draw these bright lines uh, around things that should or shouldn't happen. Uh, European Union's GDPR of recent couple years is a way of trying to draw some, some bright lines around you know, what should and shouldn't happen um, and, and things that need to go along with uh, keeping people's information, outlining responsibilities that those custodians have and, and responsibilities to their uh, constituents. Of course, HIPAA here in the United States, DLBP, these are all laws that, that draw, try to draw some bright lines around some of these privacy issues. And of course, the US Constitution and all the founding documents, those are gigantic frameworks that say, hey, these are the principles that we should be uh, adhering to. And of course, following off on that, you know, all the legal statutes. So it's hopefully I gave you some thoughts um, from some of the students on uh, on, on some things to worry about as you work with big data and you work with analytics, uh, machine learning and all these kind of neat tools. Um, a lot of good promise, but there's also some things we need to worry about and maybe draw some bright lines around. So with that, I'll turn it on back to Doug, I guess. Cool, good stuff. Let's give him a either virtual or <laughs> real, real round of applause. Good stuff, Doug. Uh, is are there any uh, any other questions? We've got like two minutes left here in the slot. I just thought I'd uh, put that out there. If there's any questions, uh, just please type them in the uh, in the chat. Um, wait a second here for uh, for questions. No questions. No questions. Cool. With uh, looks like there's uh, no questions. But Doug, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Mick, sure. are you are you ready? Yep. <clears throat> and up next is Mick Miller with uh, KeyCorp. All right, Doug. Thanks a lot for the opportunity to speak about uh, the KeyBank uh, things we've learning with enterprise monitoring. And uh, I presented this or something close to this at the uh, Elasticon back in October. And I updated it a little bit because things change all the time as we're moving along our enterprise uh, monitoring journey. Um, <clears throat> so first of all, KeyBank, uh, you know, we're across 15 states. Uh, we have about 1,100 branches, 1,400 ATMs, uh, 17,000 employees. I don't remember the number right now, 13,000 or something like that working from home now. Uh, and there's our assets and we have two data centers, uh, not counting cloud data centers. Uh, so anyways, I wanna go into a couple of, of different areas uh, really quickly and then get to the meat of the thing. So when I walked into KeyBank, uh, gosh, it was actually three years ago um, this month, uh, uh, I was asked to take over the enterprise monitoring team. And the first thing you do when you're doing that kind of work is do kind of an audit and get a sense of what's there uh, and figure out you know, how things are done in the monitoring arena. I, I stepped into something pretty similar to this. We found about 21 different monitoring systems uh, across the, the thing. And I think this is pretty typical of, of, uh, of 
uh, enterprise organizations, not so much in startups, and 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 things evolve over time, and 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 they usually evolve along uh, silos. Uh, you know, the the networking guys have their solution, the apps guys have their solution, the security guys have their solution, and so on. And the difficulty with uh, with uh, designing uh, something, and I like to call this design by entropy, uh, and uh, and and you get really slow mean time to resolution, but you get really great mean time to blame, uh, which basically means uh, uh, the way I look at it is uh, each person's monitoring system is a silo, and you only can see you know what's going on in their system, and they can see well it's nothing wrong here. Uh, and what we want to do is pull it all together so we can get a better view of all of the work. Uh, the next thing is uh, difficult to identify root causes of, of problems, uh, poor uh, mobile app satisfaction scores because we didn't have visibility, and poor branch uh, workstations. And I'll go into a little bit details around that uh, and the things how a, a good enterprise monitoring solution works. So one of the things you can see here is if you look really closely, this looks like an arc. And I like to call this Noah's Ark of Monitoring, two of everything. Uh, so uh, about uh, the time around uh, 2017, uh, we got the opportunity uh, to design the architecture and we had a whole uh, kind of a, a plan to scale out. We kind of stayed on that, but uh, what happened is uh, we had a very, uh, we had a big situation in late 2017 where it really had to push everything forward and so uh basically uh we had some challenges so one thing our our, our splunk infrastructure was uh scaled uh to not handle the amount uh, you know licensing amount of data and it was uh, the cost to upgrade that was uh, exorbitant basically and so we uh had to limit uh, what we were monitoring uh, be because of that. We had a huge backlog of monitoring requests because of this. Uh, we noticed that there was a, on the Eastern Washington, we started having some really uh, uh, difficult problems uh, with uh, some branches on the east uh, side there uh, of Washington. And we didn't really know what was going on because we didn't have any monitoring down at the client level, uh, you know, the, the workstation level. So we uh, thought uh, really quickly to, to, to deploy uh, log stash, uh, rather metric beats and, and win long beats to look at the logs. And so we can gather data to try and understand what the problem was. Uh, after we deployed these uh, in our dev environment, we didn't even have our prod environment set up. Within two days, we figured out the root cause and a remediation project was launched immediately. So uh, we hadn't really seen that kind of response. And then we noticed that the situation was not just uh, in the Eastern branches. Uh, in, in, it was over two days, we deployed uh, beats to 10,500 different workstations uh, th through automation. Uh, and, and then, but there was still additional problems. So uh, we, cleared the, the, we cleared the pathway. Uh, our first production cluster was deployed in mid, uh, uh, 2018, but then we had this additional problem was uh, was funding, and I, I often get this question: is you know how did you fund it and uh, in, to put a you know a big infrastructure in place? And the main way that we ended up funding it was was uh, retiring existing systems uh, and using the, those savings, both on licensing costs, support costs, and whatnot, to pay for the infrastructure. Um, and, and so we eliminated well over $5 million worth of uh, monitoring costs, and that helped, uh, that helped uh, re remove those. So we're, we're on a path now uh, to reduce th that 21 to maybe a handful of five or six or something like that, depending on the platform. But uh, ultimately, the mindset is one. So that is to say, have all the data in one place. Well, uh, so, so as we move uh, to this is kind of the business problem that, that this has set us up. When you start designing a cluster that's gonna receive that much data, traditional uh, approaches uh, to doing that. So one, one approach is a streaming approach at a high level. The second approach is a, um, a data island approach, which was uh, basically everything goes into some kind of data store and then you start analyzing it. And we ended up choosing uh, the streaming approach because we felt that the response time was really critical in a monitoring system. And, and so in our design, we, we designed in some SLAs, for example, and we always like to use this case that a, uh, an ATM in Alaska should be able to uh, have data indexed and available in 
uh, Kibana, which is the, the, the visualization piece of Elasticsearch in, in under a half a second. And we're still keeping that SLA today. And, and we didn't feel like uh, from a visualization perspective and a notification perspective that the uh, data island approach with, uh, with using different technologies there could get us that kind of performance. So basically, we just basically send everything uh, to a streaming. I'll talk a little bit more about that. So here's a really important thing is, is, as, is, is if you haven't started Elasticsearch or you know, any kind of big streaming infrastructure, the bad news, it's nearly impossible to, pre to precisely predict your workload. And the reason you can't do that is <clears throat> at the front end of things is you don't really ever have an idea of how these indexes will grow, how many ingestions you'll be required to do, uh, what the query usage would be, uh, and so on and so on. So there's a, uh, and, and the other thing is, is that Elasticsearch as you're trying to, if, you know, in this case, we're talking about Elasticsearch, it's not, a, it's not a relational database and it doesn't scale like a data store. It's a very different model. So you have to get your head around that. The good news is it's, it's, it is possible to design for growth and that's what we took our approach. And that's why, you know, most of this talk is really gonna be focused mostly on, uh, you know, how we, how we grew it. So we started off with a really small cluster uh, running on uh, Nutanix and, uh, and, 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 and then we figured out uh, that what we had to do is ensure that we could scale out and up the infrastructure with no, with no outages. And, and, and the only path to that is through automation. Uh, so that's, that's really important for us. And uh, a lot of this, and I recommend you look at this, is Elasticsearch for Fun and Profit. It's, uh, uh, this guy's written a good book on this, and he says, there's no way anyone can tell you how to design the perfect cluster. For those who claim, they are liars. And, and we find that that statement is very true because we sort of tried to do it. So let me go through a couple of the iterations that we went through. Uh, our very first iteration was, as I mentioned, a tiny cluster. You can see in here, we only had four uh, nodes here. Uh, but the main design that we, that, that, we, that we started with has not really changed that much. So, so you know, we have uh, data coming into what we call our uh, log stash or directly into our event streaming. And, and we use Kafka for this. And, 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 and then Kafka has, we kind of think of Kafka as, as, in, as the inbound topic and the outbound topic. And, and we use an enrichment tier uh, with log stash to stream in the raw data and then write out to an enriched topic the uh, the data and we like to enrich the we like to enrich the data with things that don't normally come along with the packet like service now data the cmdb kind of things or 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 sometimes if it's a log it's a big blob of data so what we end up doing is taking that data and and parsing out things from the log that we feel are important and, and then we pump that down in uh, with another log stash cluster uh, feeding from that, uh, I'll put the, uh, the, uh, the enriched topic, pulling that and then pulling it into Elasticsearch. So if you can imagine, you know, you've got like a, um, you've got way out here, a, um, a beat running on an ATM, which is what we have. It, it'll run into Kafka, it'll get uh, enriched down here, then shoved down to um, data, data pump and in its index in under a half a second. So the performance if you design it correctly, it's really amazing. Uh, then uh, our next, uh, actually, this is a previous. Uh, this slide is a little bit wrong here on the current, <clears throat> and and we moved it up to a, a much larger cluster uh, uh, for development, and so that helped us. And, and this was the point where we had to bring in uh, the the branches, and these were all VMs, by the way, no physical computers in, in this model. And so, uh, and, and, and that's basically what that model even pretty much looks like today. I think we expanded it just a little bit, but it's enough for our development. In production, uh, on the other hand, our first iteration, uh, we ended up having 10 uh, clusters, but you'll notice if, if you work with Elasticsearch uh, in the past, that we didn't really segment out any of the, uh, the different services uh, on either uh, Elastic, other than uh, the master nodes and the, and, the, and the data nodes. In Kafka, we didn't do that at all. Uh, and we found that that was a bit of a problem, uh, just kind of a zoom in of that in, in terms of performance. Uh, and so we ended up going to the next iteration, uh, and I'll just zoom into this piece here, where we pulled out uh, the coordinator nodes, which is, uh, does exactly what it says. We pulled out the master nodes, uh, we, uh, and we pulled out uh, ML nodes, 
uh, the master nodes are up here. And then we also uh, made sure that we had a, a separate monitoring uh, cluster. So that's doing all the monitoring uh, and so on. So you can see, you know, now we started breaking out service. We did the very same thing with Kafka at, at this point where we pulled out Kafka, I'll go back to this picture here, where we pulled out Zookeeper up here, we pulled out KSQL and we left the da data nodes tight. But you notice if you just look really closely here, nothing really changed in, in, in our core architecture. We just were able to scale out. I'll let you know that in prod and in, 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 in dev, we never had an outage as, as we scaled any of this stuff. It was just, just simply a migration. So some of the pain points along the way is the hyper-converged systems did not really perform. There was way too many IO ops. And so uh, we had to address that. Our, uh, and, and so uh, there's a lot of replications with the VM tier. And I know we can do some of that off, but, the, but, but we don't really want replication, uh, especially uh, when you have a, a cluster, it, it kind of, it, it'll, it'll basically compete uh, for resources. And we felt like our, our integration pipeline was too fragile. So what we ended up doing is, is we moved the cluster to uh, just the data nodes to physical nodes. And boy, that really made a huge difference. But we left a lot of the coordinator nodes, the zookeeper, and a bunch of other stuff on virtual machines. And that gave us really way better expansion and performance, especially when you're running everything off of SSD drives uh, on those physical. So unless you plan to leave Elasticsearch to power you know, a search of a blog or a small e-commerce uh, e e site, your first uh, design will fail. And, and this is what the, the, the current design looks like at cluster, at uh, here, at, at our current cluster. For, uh, we have 14 uh, hot data nodes, 29 uh, warm data nodes, uh, six cold data nodes. Each one of these are really big. And we still kept like the Elasticsearch master clusters, the coordinator, the monitoring, and the ML stuff over on, um, uh, virtual devices. Um, we're in just about 1.5 terabytes a day and it's growing really every day. Uh, we, uh, and we mentioned that we have about three terabytes of RAM, uh, 638 cores, uh, and this is uh, the, the data on the hot, hot nodes. And, and this will probably keep us through to the end of this year and we'd expect an, an expansion uh, later on. We learned a lot about the node specs and, uh, and what to do and what not to do. Uh, for example, uh, we started off uh, through some advice of a consultant that uh, no longer is working with us, that we set the heap size to 64 gig, and that turned out to be a really painful performance experience. Uh, and, and I won't go into the details around that right now, uh, but we, we ended up reducing that to 30 gigs and, and we got the performance we were looking for. You don't need a lot of uh, RAM necessarily, and, and the disk uh, obviously is what, what you need. Um, so let me switch over to, so we, you know, so what, what's at the core of our decisions that's never changed. We want to make sure that our design principles always had an independently scalable uh, tiers. So if I need to expand, for example, the, the tier for uh, ingestion, I could independently scale that without affecting anything else. If, if I decided that Logstash was not something I wanted to use anymore, and I wanted to say use uh, streams or some other technology, I can pull an entire technology stack out without affecting uh, really much of anything. Um, and, and so we want to make sure that everything was loosely coupled, highly available, and, 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 and designed to maintain the environment during business hours with no outages. And this is another view of our logical architecture. I mentioned the endpoints. Uh, we have like uh, Dynatrace uh, data coming in and all of that comes into our message queue again, which is um, uh, uh, Kafka. Uh, we got this enrichment tier up here. We've stuck and used the Elastic Common Schema. Things come in from a custom app of our, that we built called Watch It and ServiceNow to help do the enrichment. The data uh, pump pushes things out to Elastic. Uh, we also use MOOCsoft as our core correlation tier and, uh, and the incidents are created and, and, and we're these are like future things, ticketing, notification and self-healing are some of the things that we're building in the future. But this is our core architecture that we have in place today. And, uh, and most of it is, you know, is, is in, in the open source world. So how to scale. Um, how much time do I have left, Doug? Uh, it's about four minutes, four, yeah, about four minutes. Yep. Perfect. Uh, so I wanted to, you know, so how do you scale a system? So indep independently scalable tools allow for surgical scaling. And that's really an important thing as you learn more about the system. HA tiers allow for production live updates and physical 
Uh, today, and we'll probably change this in the future, but our virtuals are Kafka, Elasticsearch Master and Coordinator nodes, physical are the data nodes. And I know that I worked with Doug at a startup a while ago, and we really found that keeping your data nodes on physical devices is probably a much better, is definitely a better way to do things. And also Logstash gets really complicated when you set up clusters. So we ended up putting uh, our Logstash streams uh, into containers using uh, Kubernetes. And so the, the, here's probably the, the main thing is I wanted to let you guys know is what are the things that you need to pay attention to? And we had to boil it down to a few things. And, and, uh, and so basically, if you're trying to keep things under a half a second, uh, and uh, so, so you'll have to make sure that you use the right streaming architecture to do that. Uh, so make sure you have some kind of measurement, uh, including SLAs across the board. And we have a whole slew of them to make sure that we're, we're doing that. Also, when, when you're looking at end-to-end -end indexing speeds, you'll find that uh, you know, when we were first doing things and making sure we had our SLAs met, sometimes Elastic seemed to be the bottlenecks. Other times Kafka seemed to be the bottleneck. Other times it was the enrichment tier that was the bottleneck. And as I mentioned, we were able to ind independently scale these tiers to keep those SLAs in place. Um, the, the, the other things is, is we did when, when uh, things get too high approximately, it's time to tune or scale out. So uh, that's really important. And one last thing. This is, I want to skip through this. We automated everything that, that's really important. And this is the last thing I wanted to mention is, is the number of, in, in Elasticsearch, the number of shards per node is the key indicator. That's your leading indicator that you're going to start or are currently having degraded performance. You can also look at things like IOs, uh, IO ops, heap size, garbage collection, CPU utilization, and so on. So that's it. I wanted to uh, spend some time uh, looking, uh, sharing some of the things that we learned at, uh, at KeyBank along our enterprise monitoring journey with uh, both Kafka and Elasticsearch. So, uh, Doug, back to you. Really great stuff, Nick. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, so we've got a question since we've got a minute and a half left. Uh, love to hear, I'm reading the question here on the chat. Uh, love to hear what were your two or three biggest mistakes and what you learned from and how you'd approach it differently if you could do it again. Yeah, so, so one of the biggest, mis well, it wasn't really a mistake. It was really a cost problem. But uh, one of the biggest mistakes was was putting the data nodes, putting the data nodes on virtual devices. Uh, but at the time, that's all we really could afford uh, in terms of, and, and we had to prove value first. And, uh, you know, once we were able to do that, uh, you know, we got comments like, you know, oh, Elasticsearch, what's that? Is that the, you know, the new monitoring flavor of the month? And, uh, and, and so, uh, you know, we listened to that kind of feedback. And, and so the, 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 the other thing uh, that I think is another kind of a, a downfall uh, or potential problem is, uh, is underestimating the, um, so, so underestimating the, the, the business value that you're providing uh, to the organization. We first were just thinking about enterprise monitoring, but later uh, we found that we were providing uh, enormous value just for example, to the ServiceNow team uh, because they started doing the reporting in, in, in Kibana. So uh, we really under, underestimated, what does that mean in terms of, an un, uh, of a bad or a, uh, not such a good thing is our Kibana usage like slammed us. So we had to scale out the, the coordinator nodes massively to, to deal with that. Um, and there's probably, I probably talked for an hour about all the good and bad things that happened. Those are probably the big ones. Anything else? No, that's, that's good stuff. Um, I, we got to hit, we're hit time here. Um, it was a fantastic, uh, fantastic presentation, Mick. Everybody give him a real or a virtual uh, round of applause. That's, uh, that's great stuff. Hey, uh, uh, Doug, I'm going to actually drop off because it's my uh, anniversary today and my wife's waiting for me downstairs. Oh, that is dedication. I'm telling you right there. That is, that is big data dedication. Uh, right. Mick, it's very great to have you. Thank you for, for presenting. All right. Thanks, guys. Thanks, everyone. Um, so we got uh, Hannah from uh, Pandata up on deck. I see her. Um, Hannah, you uh, you ready uh, to go? Yes. Um, just getting the screen. Cool. And uh, whenever you're ready, take it away. 
All right, well, uh, good, good evening, everyone. And thanks for the opportunity to speak here today. Um, it's a little strange to do this virtually. So I am picturing everyone listening with rapt interest as I talk. Um, so my name is Hannah Arnson, and I am lead data scientist at Pandata. And Pandata is, uh, why is this not advancing? There we go. Pandata is a data science consulting company based here in Cleveland, where we help innovative organizations plan, design, and scale artificial intelligence solutions. We pride ourselves on being approachable, ethical, and designing uh, solutions built for humans. And so today I will be talking about the ethical portion. As I'm sure you saw from the title, uh, we will be focusing on bias today. So what, what is bias? When we talk about an artificial intelligence solution, this can mean a couple different things. So there's statistical bias, which is where uh, the mathematical concept where the expected value differs from a true value. And then there's the social concept. Uh, so in the social concept, this refers to unfair prejudice in favor of or against a person or group. So in addition to the ethical issues, bias can lead to, um, well, there are many ethical issues around bias, um, including intended and unintended consequences. And in addition to the ethical issues, it can lead to model underperformance, which from a business perspective um, can lead to you know, lost revenue, revenue left on the table, um, and other, other sorts of things. So I think everyone can agree that there is bias in human behavior. And as we replace more human judgment and decision making with advanced AI solutions, it becomes clear that the AI solutions are not necessarily free from these same kinds of biases which can often have problematic results. With increasing frequency, cases pop up in the news about AI solutions that result in sexism, racism, other kinds of inequity. So for example, things around um, the criminal justice system or healthcare or facial recognition and just jobs. And it's not that these are necessarily the direct product of I want to design a racist or sexist algorithm but rather a uh, result from biases present in human behavior. You know, and typically the first line of defense is, uh, but we removed race as a variable. However, removing race is not sufficient to fix the underlying inequities within society. You know, unfortunately, there are systematic biases that get detected algorithmically and then can be propagated. So in this cartoon uh, shown here, we have data, that goes into some black box AI solution and then comes out with a decision. And it is the job of these algorithms to identify patterns in extremely large data sets around human behavior and decisions. So if the data is biased, then it goes into the AI system and a biased decision comes out. You know, the algorithm's job is to detect these patterns, so it doesn't know if the pattern it's detecting is some byproduct of racism or inequity, or if it's an, a meaningful pattern that should be picked up on. So while AI is not necessarily going to destroy everything, it is also not necessarily going to um, save everything. The intent is not to design a discriminatory algorithm, but it's not as simple as designing a system to not be overtly discriminating. And I've been asked the question before, why can't you just tell the robot not to be racist? So unfortunately, it's not that simple. Uh, to give you a little bit more of a concrete example here, let's say you're, select, uh, you're tasked with the concept of building an AI solution to help select clubs for students at a local high school. I think you would, show, you would find, as a random sampling of high school, the club membership is not equally distributed by gender. So in this example, we have a robotics club, which has five boys and one girl, and a crafting club, which has four girls. If you were to make a simple course selector based on this distribution, then all of the males would be recommended the robotics club, and most of the females the crafting club. Now this is obviously an oversimplification. And if you design the algorithm to ignore gender, then the scenario would be different. However, there are other variables that may be taken into account that are proxies for gender. So for example, more students on the volleyball team are in the crafting club than in the robotics club. And more students on the football team are in the robotics club than crafting, at least in theory. 
Now, in real life, we know that underrepresented minorities can be actively discouraged from participating, or they can view it as not for them because they lack role models who have successfully become doctors or CEOs or data scientists. Uh, so interestingly, I looked at the Bureau of Labor Statistics uh, data and computer and mathematical occupations, which roughly covers data scientists, only 25% are female and only 8% are black. So it is not that much of a stretch to imagine that an algorithm around hiring can detect these patterns. So what do we do about this? You know, there are steps that one can take and tools that exist to help mitigate bias and unintended consequences. Uh, so for the rest of this talk, I'm going to go through a project that Pandata has been working on as a case study in addressing algorithmic bias. So we have been working with a major university to develop an AI solution to recommend student engagement opportunities. So these are things like clubs, internships, uh, study abroad, research, other kinds of things like that as part of a larger engagement initiative. The goal of the project is to facilitate student engagement to enrich experiences on the campus and within the greater community. And as part of the university mission, engaged students are happier and more successful and that benefit both the campus, the university, and the whole um, larger community. The main goal is to target the unengaged. And this can range from the kid who thinks they are too cool to participate, um, to the kid who'd rather play video games all day, and the first to the first generation college student who is unfamiliar with the system, uh, so they don't know the benefits or expectations around extracurricular participation. Something that came out of our stakeholder research with the university was that inclusivity and diversity are identified as uh, key goals of this project by the vast majority of both the faculty, staff, and students. So how do you take underlying data that reflects engagement stratification and use it to redistribute opportunities? The way in which we've been approaching this is using a recommender system. Um, so a recommender system is a, a series of AI or machine learning solutions that at least are all familiar with the output. So this is things like Netflix, um, Amazon, Pandora, where it takes your prior experience and recommends things that it thinks you might like. Uh, so here it has shown an example of what Amazon thinks that I would like based on my very refined uh, reading tastes. And there are two main kinds of systems here. We have a collaborative system which is based on both prior behavior of the individual and behavior of similar individuals, and then content-based, which is based on the similarity of the different products. So using information about individual students and students like them, we can generate recommendations of things they can do to become engaged, so the clubs, the internships, the study abroad. Now off the bat, this has some obvious potential pitfalls. If you are recommending opportunities based on prior experience or experience of similar students, what do you do when a student isn't already engaged? Now this is called uh, the cold start problem. This refers to the idea that there's insufficient data to begin identifying patterns. Underrepresented minorities are less likely to be engaged, we know. So how do we design a system that doesn't just perpetuate these biases? Now there are some ways to address this problem, including using information we do have, such as demographics and coursework. However, a lack of solid participation early in the college career can have lasting ramifications. So another pitfall of a recommender system is siloing, which refers to the idea that like begets like. So in this example here, we have student A who participates in the orchestra and the violin club and the jazz band. Uh, we have student B who participates in the orchestra, the jazz band, and the drum circle. And student C who participates in the orchestra. They go looking for a recommendation and they are suggested uh, the jazz band and the drum circle. Now in this example, music students are getting recommended more music related things. So this example of siloing is, re is relatively benign. And in our experience, this is a phenomenon that we did observe. Uh, we started calling it the sorority problem because during our initial modeling, we found that there is a sizable group of students whose only activities were in sororities. And so all of the recommendations that were being generated were also sorority related. However, this problem can also be uh, more problematic in amplifying inequity. So in this example, we have student A who is plugged in at the university, has a lot of connections, 
and mentors and joined the business club and the networking club. Based on these participations, the recommender suggests internship club. Student B, let's say, is a first generation college student who's, who's not familiar with college life. Maybe they're also working, so they have no extracurricular activities. Based on an out of the box recommender system, there isn't much for them to be comparative. So we'd have limited good recommendations, meaning they would just get a random suggestion. So this means they might end up missing out on internship or career changing extracurricular programs. So this brings us to the issues of equality and equity. Equality refers to the idea that all students have an equal chance of being exposed to an opportunity, regardless of membership in a demographic or affinity group. So in the previous example, the first generation student who lacked the comfort and familiarity with the system to get involved and therefore was not recommended the great internship was lacking in equality. Equity goes a step further and tries to level an uneven playing field. In this case, equity refers to recommendations specifically targeting groups of interest with the goal of actively increasing diversity without penalizing the dominant group. So then how do you measure and achieve equity and equality? This brings us to the equity kernel. Uh, to try to, to achieve these goals, we've developed what we are calling internally the equity kernel. It's a set of rules, algorithms, and metrics aimed at addressing equality and equity in our recommender system output. And it consists of four steps, so metrics, uh, reducing bias in the underlying data, reducing bias in the model output, and human feedback. In order to begin addressing inequality, there must be a way to measure it. And so the first step is to define a set of metrics. This is both within the training data and within the model output. The next step is to identify groups of interest. In protected classes. So in higher ed, this consists of groups such as, um, or features such as race, ethnicity, gender, first generation college students, low income students. Um, and an interesting subtlety in this problem is that um, there are some, there are some group cases where it is both accepted and acceptable that there will be an unequal distrib distribution of groups. So unlike um, say an AI solution determining if you are qualified for a job, there are situations where, um, for example, the women in science group is likely to be mostly female and that's okay. And there will be religious and cultural groups that will be made up primarily of a particular ethnic group and that's okay. But the complication in this is identifying these cases uh, when it is okay to have this um, homo homogeneous makeup from a fairly sizable data set that is not necessarily labeled with this intent at all. So once we have metrics and a way to quantify, we move on to reducing bias in underlying data. I don't have time to get into any of the technical details here today. But there are some really great tools that are available. Um, the IBM AI Fairness 360 Toolkit is a really great resource that has um, a whole host of metrics, ways to distribute training data to reduce the impact of biases, um, ways to, to affect the output as well. And the next step is looking at the model output. Uh, so we test for equality and take steps to incorporate equity um, into the output as well. And I just like to point out that uh, we are not using protected class status in any of the training data. It is used only when measuring for equity and equality. And again, I'm not going to get into the technical details here, but the AI, uh, IBM AI 360 Fairness Toolkit has a lot of really great features. And finally, we get to human feedback. And since this is a human, largely a human problem, and we are making recommendations for people, this involves extensive discussions with faculty and staff along around how to design an inclusive, unbiased solution. Um, we also rely heavily on feedback collected from students on the recommendations. And it's just important to note that like so much in data science and AI, this is an iterative process. And while we don't have it perfectly sound yet, we are getting better and working towards a more equitable solution. So developing new AI solutions has so much potential to enrich lives, and in this case, the student experience. However, with increasing complexity comes increasing risk of missing something key. However, the awareness that bias is a persistent problem and taking steps to measure, mitigate, 
and continue to refine can go a very long way towards generating an equitable AI. So with that, I will turn it over and take any questions. Let's see, we've got uh, one question here. Uh, what examples of reducing bias have you seen from your own academic experiences, uh, whether that be in the PhD studies or a post, uh, post undergrad? Um, sorry, um, okay, just have to clear my screen there, yes. Um, so I think, I mean, that, that's an interesting question. In my experience, um, a lot of outreach was really important, I think, in reducing bias in the sense of getting kids who wouldn't necessarily be exposed to academics or um, just even the concept that this like higher, higher ed study is something for them is really key at a young age, that kind of intervention. Um, mentorship programs, I think, are also very important. Um, we've got uh, a few minutes left. Are there uh, any other questions uh, for uh, for Hannah? Going once. Cool. Well, Hannah, thank you so much for for doing the talk. Everybody, give give a, a round of applause here. I'm seeing both virtual and uh, uh, applause come in. Um, thank you, everyone. And uh, yeah, uh, it's it's good good stuff. And again, uh, thanks everybody for uh, for attending and uh, for making this possible. Um, I know that uh, that John has the uh, the recording thing on, so we should be able to post it. Um, and and again, look forward to a meetup in uh, in July. And everybody, stay safe and uh, don't drink any bleach. Okay. That joke will be dated if anyone is re seeing this on video a couple of years from now, but uh, it's funny now though. Um, so again, stay safe everybody.